give you thanks. We give you thanks, God, for being that mighty fortress, that strength. And we uh, desire to know that today in a very real way. And so thank you for the worship that leads us into your presence and strengthen us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Children, you're going to be dismissed uh, for Children's Church. Um, and BBS, I think, is coming up next month. So make sure you grab your cards and uh, note cards and things and know what's uh, happening with VBS because that's going to be another great week and it's going to be dried up by then, I think. <laughs> I hope. Otherwise, we'll change the theme from, uh, what's the theme again, Julie? Camp out. Camp out. There it is right there. Uh, from camping out to uh, water, some water theme, I don't know. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. There you go. I like it. I like it. <laughs> You've just been uh, re recruited for the team. I want to hit a couple of quick announcements, uh, one major one, but as you think about the summer and we head into uh, more uh, of these activities like uh, the VBS and the Backyard Bash, there's going to be lots of opportunity for you to serve in different ways. We need lots of people. Use your gifts, your strength, uh, whether it be volunteering with the, the children's VBS team or helping us out with the Backyard Bash. There's uh, cards like this on the wooden table out there that say Backyard Bash, and that's a community event, a place for you to, to bring somebody, bring a friend, and have a free lunch, and have some other free activities, and just let them know about Living Waters Church. So that'll be a good, good day. And then the next day, we'll have an outdoor worship service, and baptism, and lunch. So there's lots of ways to get involved. And then in August, we're going to have a, a Minnesota Teen and Adult Challenge with us, and we're gonna have a lunch for them, too. So you'll be getting hit with lots of emails asking, to, to help out if you can in some way, because many hands, light work, that type of a thing. And uh, giving has been a little bit slow this, uh, this past couple of months as far as our general fund. Gary gave a great, uh, exciting encouragement from our, uh, our thank you, because I had one right there. It was just, <laughs> you just removed it. Uh, the obstacles removed campaign. Uh, you're such a great church. As I get older and stumble even more, I know you're just going to help me. You're just going to come alongside me and give me words to say. And so that's been going well. Our general fund's been uh, not, uh, we've been meeting our expenses, praise God, but uh, not the budget. And so just uh, take a look at that, pray, think about the box or online giving. One other uh, issue for a major prayer for our body is uh, our youth uh, director transition. And Chris is out camping, right, Raquel? Chris and the boys, yeah, he, I think he wimped out. He didn't go Friday when it was really raining. And then I won't, I won't call him out on that because he was there. And they got wet last night, I'm sure, yesterday some. And now they're having a beautiful day. Some of the men and boys are out camping this weekend. And so Chris and Raquel have served with the youth uh, many years. Chris has been our, our director of, uh, of youth ministry, student ministries, for four years and uh, needs to step away from that position. But they're going to stay with us and uh, continue to be a part of our church, uh, Chris and Raquel and their family and even serve in the youth ministry as volunteers, so we're really thankful for them. We'll have an appreciation time, recognition of Chris's leadership on Sunday, August 25th. Some want it to become a roast. Are you okay with that? <laughs> if you say yes, then we'll, we'll go that direction. And, uh, and then also, these are my ABCDs. Appreciation, we're building an organizational plan. Julie and Mr. Roach and uh, Chris have met together. <laughs> Garrett Roach, Roach have uh, met uh, to plan uh, out the calendar. They're working with the youth ministry leaders and coming up with a calendar and all kinds of things like that to make sure we're ready for not only this summer but the next school year. And then uh, we're also searching for a, a, a director, a halftime director. There's sheets out on the wall that have a student ministries director job description, a ministry description. And if we can't find one right away, then uh, the contingency plan is... Uh, to have uh, as many as us come alongside and help. What can we do? How can we help in the youth ministry? Can you offer your home for a night, a, a potluck dinner or something like that? Can you offer to drive a van to retreat? Can you, can you do something along that line, teach a lesson? And so let's just support. We love our youth and uh, our children and youth are a great asset and, uh, and a blessing to this church. They're not the future church, they're the church right now today. Okay, and so we need to continue to strengthen them. So appreciate Chris, build an organizational plan, have a contingency that calls on all of us, and then the director of youth ministry, uh, search, 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 search. We've been searching, put in this, uh, this ministry description to the various colleges and universities and seminaries in our area, and uh, also contacting different youth ministry leaders that we know, networking, 
and uh, right now it's it's not an easy find. There's a lot of they're not unfortunately not a lot of the colleges and seminaries are training youth ministry uh, students anymore, and uh, that's a that's a that breaks my heart to tell you the truth. But anyways, uh, pray for Chris and uh, Raquel and their family as they transition out. Uh, pray for the youth director process and pray for our youth and our middle school students. Uh, this verse has always been important to me in youth ministry, Colossians 2, 6 and 7. We want the youth to receive Christ Jesus as Lord, to continue to live in him, to be rooted and built in him, to be strengthened in the faith and overflowing with thankfulness. If that can be a reflection of who our youth are and our youth leaders, then uh, we, we have uh, been faithful with uh, what God has gifted us with. So, Father, as we uh, continue now in worship and the study of your word, we pray that you would guide our, our thoughts. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts in this building here right now and online be focused and set on you, pleasing to you, and may your spirit guide and lead us to the steps that you desire us to take today and throughout this week as your followers, as your worshipers, as your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. And so this summer, I've been wanting to focus on strength, gaining strength, the right type of strength that we need. And many of you, when I first started it, I asked you to raise your hands, and, uh, and many of you said, yeah, I, I could use some strength. I could use some strength from the Lord. And we started with some uh, various passages, Old Testament, New Testament. Today is, is the passage that is the foundation for all of these messages about God's strength. And you'll find throughout the, the summer, as you listen in, a couple of different keys. How do you, how do you really grab onto this? How do you make this God's strength your strength? And uh, today, uh, we see this psalm from David, Psalm 18. And I'm going to also add in Proverbs 18 because it, uh, it brings in the same type of strength to the name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, the ones who are getting right with God and finding their righteous strength from Christ, they run into that tower and they are saved. They are saved and they are safe. And so the name of the Lord, and in this passage here in Psalm 18... David writes a hymn, and so we see the title of it, For the Director of Music of David, the Servant of the Lord. He sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies, from the hand of Saul, he said, and then he goes into this song, and he calls, he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. El Sali is the Hebrew word here for El God Sali, strength, my strength or my rock my foundation in whom I can stand firm and whom I'm protected. There's so many uh, aspects of how God is our strength, and we'll see that in, uh, in this psalm. But I want to give you just a quick overview of it because uh, so we understand where we're going. It would take us too long to uh, where we're at. We're doing pretty good with time right now. But if we had to do each verse, 50 verses, we'd be here quite a while. So here's the basic direction of it. It's a song of devotion. And so it started out, in 2 Samuel, you can read a similar, pretty close, but there's some differences in 2 Samuel 22. And what happens there is that David, now as king, is looking back on his life and he's remembering from 1 Samuel when he was being pursued by his enemies. Not just Saul, but many enemies. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Think about the enemies that come into our lives, that come to attack. And he was rescued. And so as he was thinking there now, in the safety of the palace, he wanted to give a testimony of what God had done in his life. And I know some of you are going through some really difficult times, and I hope and pray that you will see that when you go through a difficult time, it can become a testimony of how God rescued you, it can give glory to God, but it also can makes you stronger because like we sang that song, in the songs we sang about how he has been my help. He has been my rescue. And when he's been our rescue, when then we're going to trust him more. We're going to go to him. If he's rescued you before in a certain time in your life, then you know that you can run to him because he will rescue you again and trust in him. And so David is writing this testimony. When you think of, a, a, as Rachel said, a psalm or a spiritual song or a hymn, sometimes it's good if you, if you really enjoy it or if you're questioning it to go back and dig in and say, what was the history of this? Why, why was this uh, song written? Uh, and so sometimes the authors of the songs will tell you the story behind the song. David is telling us the story behind the song. 
the story behind this psalm of 18. And you can find it in 2 Samuel 22 as he recounts. But he says, and this is a very key word. Even We just read it in the English, verse 1, I love you. I love you, O Lord. But it, it's, not the, it's not a typical word of, for love that you find other places. It's, it's a different Hebrew word. And it, it has the, it has, and that's why it's hard. And you'll look at different amplified versions or King James and different things to try to figure out. And you'll see this thing of devotion, of fervency, of zeal. I, I fervently love you. I'm devoted to you. I am committed to you, God. My love is an on fire and passionate type of love where I will never leave you because of what you've done for me. And so I love you devotedly, firmly, David's love. That's the song. That's, this is the, the object of the whole thing is about God's strength and why David has found his strength in God that he loves him that way. And so then he talks about his salvation, how God thanks, he thanks God for answering his prayer and for saving him. And then in verses 7 through 19, very dramatic, very dramatic language of, uh, of strength and God's strength, very... Uh, Hard sometimes, difficult language, because when God strengthens and when God rescues, he, he comes with, uh, with might, and that might uh, blow some things away. And so we'll see that a little bit of that in just a minute. And then he talks about the security of being devoted and walking in God's ways. When I walked with him and when I was pure and when I was, and you'll, you'll question like, wow, is that David? He sounds like he's, he's perfect. And he's basically saying, when I'm devoted to God, I find his rescue. When I'm in disobedience, I walk away from his rescue. And it's an important lesson for us to hear. We want the strength of the Lord right now at this moment, at this time, but we haven't recognized that we walked away from him. And we've been in disobedience, and so we've turned away from him. And then David stresses his confidence in God. He's a shield. He's a, he, the one of the words, the translation you might read is a buckler. And a buckler is a shield that buckles around. It's like... Uh, it's a full body type of shield. It's like front airbag and side airbag. It's just, you know, you're like, I'm protected in this. You're my shield around me, Lord. You're my buckler. And then he ends with giving great praise and glory to God. Because there's a story in this that David becomes king, and he has uh, great rewards. He, he, he wins his battles. Uh, the kingdom is expanded. Many good things when David is king. But he doesn't take the credit for that. He gives glory to God. And so that's the overview of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the hymn. And in 2 Samuel, it's a historical version. This is my testimony of what God did. And now in Psalm 18, he gets together with the music director, and he says, hey, music director, I want you to put this to music. This is my testimony. It's not good enough that it's written as my testimony. We need to sing this in church. We need to sing this as a communal gathering of praise to God, because this is who God is. This is what God has done, and we need to seek the Lord our God in this together. And so he writes this as a song to be sung. Unfortunately, uh, he doesn't give us the, the music director's name or number or what the, the tune, actual tune is for us to follow. So we, we come up with it on our own today and sing it with great joy, because God has been my strength, and he is worthy of my song. I want to ask you to do something here a couple times this morning. Would you, just by raising your hand, would you give a testimony that God has ever been your strength? Have you ever had a time where you knew that God was your strength? You see, now you have a story to tell. You don't have to sing it, okay, but you can. And when the Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge come, for instance, some of them are pretty good singers. Not all of them, you know. But I feel real comfortable singing with them, <laughs> if that tells you anything. But their testimonies are powerful because they've experienced the salvation and the strength of God. And so what do we do? We hear, I'm going to narrow this down into these 50 verses into three symbols of strength. The first symbol of strength, and is if we... We trust these. Trust is going to be a key element all throughout the summer. What does it mean to trust, to walk in obedience, to, to, to obey God and to follow him, to truly trust that this is going to work, that he, he is going to provide the strength we need? And so he calls God, El Salih, O God, O Lord, you are my strength. 
my strong tower, my fortress, my rock, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield, the horn of my, he's my stronghold. And so those are all very strong uh, names and titles for who God is. Let's look at Proverbs 18, 10 real quick. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are safe. And we're going to read that again in a minute. Uh, we're going to see the following verses, the context of that. But it's about this strength of a brick, of a rock. And so when we have everything from, I mean, we know this. This is common sense wisdom. This is nursery rhyme. And they huffed and they puffed and they blew the house down because it was made of straw or it was made of sticks. But when there was one that made of bricks, they stayed safe. And so we got all kinds of people in our state right now looking for a way to keep water from coming into their homes. And they're sandbagging and they're doing all things. And some of them who live in areas where it's been flooded before, they built their house up. I read, watched a story in the news about one person who would say, hey, we were flooded out before. It was a major flood. And so I had them lift up the house and build a foundation of brick underneath it. And they're fine. Because they didn't trust in weather patterns or sand or sticks or anything like that. They built their house stronger on a foundation that is rock strong. And what we have to ask in this is what is our foundation? What is our firm path that we stand on, that we walk on, that doesn't shift back and forth? And what is it that we will build our lives upon? What's the foundation? And David was dwelling, not only this, this is very important for you to understand the, the historical context, because as he's thinking back to what, how God rescued him, he was dwelling among the caves, among the mountains, in the rocks. And his only shelter, his only physical shelter from the enemy at that time was to find a cave, was to find a, a cleft in the rocks where he could be protected from, from the enemies, from the animals, from the weather. And so they looked for and they hid in caves. And so he's saying, my God is my cave. He's my rock. He's my fortress. And he just keeps giving us more and more incredible poetry and symbolism. You see, these are human words to try to describe the almighty God because we can't do it. And so we look for as many ways as we can to find the, the character traits of who God is, his attributes, how he is divine and unholy and how why we should then trust him and so he's in the Judean hills he's trying to escape the wickedness of Saul and he compares God to this place of covering this crevice in a rock he says I've built myself I've placed myself I didn't build myself I placed myself on the rock and that's the lesson for us a fortified city a fortress a tower an unscalable wall and we have to ask ourselves what do we trust in when difficult times come what or who are we trusting in? Where do we run when a storm comes? What, what's, our, what's our fortress? And so the fortress is a strong tower. It's built on the rock, and it's, 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 it's tall. And so let's uh, move uh, yeah, to these ones here, the description. And so he's my, my cave, my cliff, the, this crevice where I'm, I'm strong in there because I'm strong in him. Uh, the fortress is like a mountain castle. The deliverer, he calls, calls him his deliverer, the one who comes to, to not only protect but to save him, to rescue him out. He's this buckler, this shield around you. He's the horn of my salvation. And that one can be interpreted a couple different ways. For some, they look at it as the strength of an animal. What's the strongest part of an animal who has a horn? What, how are they going to attack their enemy? It's usually by the rhino horn or by their antlers they're going to come. And the strength of that, the elephant tusk, is going to come and get you. That's the strength of your salvation. And hunters, they want to show their, their, their strength and everything. And so what do they mount on the wall? There? What do they take? They take that, that horn or that tusk or whatever and say, look it, I, I got that. So that's one interpretation. But there's another that I think fits this, uh, this passage better. And that is your, uh, the, the same word can be used for a mountain's peak. You're, this is my mountain peak. This is my, the horn of the mountain. This is the top. This is the shelter. This is the peak of safety. My enemies can't reach me here. My enemies can't scale this wall. They can't scale this mountain. They won't reach me at this point. And this is his peak of safety. 
run to that, run into that place. When you look back at Proverbs, let's look back at Proverbs to see uh, what other people have trusted in. And then we can ask the question of ourselves. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it. They're safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it to be an unscalable wall. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. And so he's saying some people have built their foundation and their fortress around their wealth or around their status or around their gifts, their talents, their abilities. And they imagine it to be unscalable, that nobody can touch them because they've achieved this or they've gotten to this place in their own strength. And the author of Proverbs is saying, don't do that because that will wash away or that may be taken away. There's only one unscalable wall, and that is the fortress of our God. And so what are we, what are we building our strength around when enemies come? Well, you better know who your enemies are. Scripture talks about three major enemies that we have as Christians. Satan, I'll give him the little pinky finger because he doesn't deserve. I read an author once who said, uh, I don't even capitalize Satan anymore. My computer doesn't like it because he doesn't deserve it. No, I like that. Satan, but he's alive. He's an enemy. And he was, think about him in David's context. If he can conquer David, if he can get David to be defeated, if David dies, then the Son of God, the promise of the Messiah, who will come from the line and the throne of David, is extinguished. You think he wants David alive? You think he wants David to be king? No way. You think he, he wants you to succeed in your walk with Jesus Christ? You think he wants you to, to give glory to God? You think he, he wants you to raise your hand and say, I have a testimony of God's strength and power in my life. How he rescued me. No, he doesn't. And so he will come at you. Be ready. What's your fortress? What's your armor? The second enemy is our own sinful nature. We stumble because of our own sinful nature. We fall we, we have an enemy who scales our walls because we let down our guard. You see what I'm saying? We let down our guard. David let down his guard in the palace, and he had a great sin with Bathsheba and then with her husband Uriah because he let down his guard. He didn't see the sinful nature as the enemy. We have one other enemy, and that is the world system. The system of the world, so if you keep my asses, Satan, sinful nature, and system of the world. The systems of the world say, do it this way. Be, be wealthy, be talented, be beautiful, be, be young, be all these things that, that I'm not right now. So <laughs> look at me and say, whatever he isn't, that's what the world says he should be. And the world system, and if we go along with that, and we say, that's my fortress, that's my strength, you will be wiped out. The floods will come, the storms will come, and you won't stand. So trust in God as our fortress, our mighty rock. He's our strength. The strength of his provision is all through this psalm. Verse 3, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I'm saved from my enemies. And one word shall fell that enemy. Oh, a mighty fortress. One word will come at him. Jesus. I called on the Lord. I called on his name. El Sali, my strength, and it wiped him out, and he was safe. When I call on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, I am saved from my enemies. Where's your hiding place? Where's your unscalable wall of protection? Where are you hiding? This is a place where the enemies of the world, Satan and our own sinful nature, cannot penetrate when we're walking with God and we're walking in his strength. We're trusting in him. He is our strong protection. He is immovable God. You can't budge him. You can't push through his wall. Be our rock, God. Help us to understand what it means that you are our firm foundation, our strong rock. Help us not to leave your presence. The second symbol that I see in this passage is a symbol of reach. 
David was not in a good way when he was being pursued by Saul. And so I mentioned Satan didn't want him. Saul was the world going after him. Saul was the world's, I mentioned his own sinful nature. Do you see the enemies of David here? Do you understand what they are? Satan didn't want him to succeed. Saul was thinking the world system, he's king. He doesn't want David to king. I want it all for myself. I want it for my son, Jonathan. You've got you to go, David. And the world will come at us in different ways like that. And then his own sinful nature. And so it got him to a place where he uses this incredible language. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction, they overwhelmed me. The waves just kept coming and coming and coming, and I felt wrapped up. There was a man I knew from Berean Baptist that just loved to fish, and I felt just terrible when he passed away. He had gotten caught up in the anchor rope of his boat. And when he fell into the, 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 the waters, he was twisted up and tangled up. And I say that with respect because I want you to have a visual picture of what it means to be entangled in the cords of death. Just terrible. But if we don't understand the storm, we won't ever cry out to God for help. If we know that we are truly in a storm where we feel like David feels here, that this cancer, this illness, this relationship tragedy, all that's going around me is like the grave coiled around me. The cords of the grave, verse 5, the snares of death, they confronted me. So what did he do? In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice. So I sought the Lord. And he answered I cried out to the Lord, and he answered, I hope and pray that that's part of your testimony when you give a testimony, that you say, I was saved from this because I cried out to God, and he rescued me. His strong arm, Isaiah talks about, his reach, his righteous right hand. David was hidden in this secure protection of God, the strong tower, but he was still being pursued. He was still in the battle, and in his distress, I called the Lord, and he heard my voice. Some people have a hard time with that. That's why you've got to share your testimony. People have a hard time that they heard God's voice or that they, they feel like God heard their voice. God heard their cry. So many times when people are in trouble, they say, God, you're not hearing my cry. You're not listening. You're not doing anything about my cry for help. Do you hear me, God? Are you present, Lord? Can you reach down into this battle, into this water, into this storm, and lift me up? So when the disciples were in the boat being tossed and everything else, where was Jesus? In the front, asleep, at peace. You've got to see the picture of that. You've got to see the lesson that he was teaching them in that. It doesn't matter how big your castle is or how big your boat is or how big this that your protection and your peace, your refuge, that you can rest and you can be calm because you know that you are protected by the strong arms of God. Why are you so afraid? Our God is immovable. He's a strong protector, and he reaches down. This is where our security is. He came powerfully, verses 7 through 15, just powerful visuals. The earth trembled when God came to rescue David. It quaked. The foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because God was angry. God was angry at what the unrighteousness that was taking place. He was angry at the unfairness. And that's what we want from him too, don't we? God wants you to be angry about injustice. This isn't fair. I want you to be angry, God, about how my enemies are coming at me. I want you to be angry, God. Listen now. I want you to be angry, God, at my sinful nature. So that I learn what it means to get back on the right path, the righteous path. Something to study a little bit further. Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth, burning all this. Verse 9, he parted the heavens and he came down. You see, some people, they study this psalm as a a messianic psalm, a messianic psalm of Jesus coming and and coming to our rescue, and they see all kinds of visuals of who Jesus is, and and even Jesus uh, in his own suffering, and how they they came upon him. 
and how they, 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 they attacked him, how they confronted me, how, uh, how all these different, you can look at that and try and find Jesus in there in both ways, in his suffering and in him being the rescuer. And they see it as a messianic psalm coming down. It's an interesting study. First and foremost, this is a psalm of David. We already heard that. We know what it is. Okay, so let's learn from David. If it points us to Jesus like so many of the psalms do, then praise God, let's learn from that. Some see it as a end of times, a, a revelation psalm. And they see some of this language like this, just like the end of days in, in Revelation, and they match it. No matter what your eschatology is, this, is, this phrase here is consistent for every eschatology. Listen to it again. He parted the heavens, and he came down. Dark clouds were under his feet, and he mounted the cherubim, and he flew, and he soared on the wings of the wind. He made the darkness his covering, his canopy on the dark cloud rains came, and out of the brightness of his presence, the clouds advanced. It's hailstorms and lightning and his voice thundering, the most high. It is this picture of God, and David is telling us in his testimony that when I was in this battle, and I felt like I was totally under and, and dying. He parted the heavens. He heard my cry. He parted the heavens. And he came. And he came to my rescue. He reached down. His arm's not too short. So well, we like to, some of the guys like to golf, right? And uh, golf, people golf for different reasons. Oh, there's my clock to make sure I don't run over time. Oh, boy. Put that away right now. And uh, they... Uh, Different golfers like to score low. They like to score low. That's what their goal is. Uh, that's too negative to me. Negative, par, mar, two under, ten under. That's, that's negative. You look at the score, not two, less, minus. It's all negative. And so I go for the positive. How, how, much, how many times can I hit the ball? How, many, how, how high can I go? Because, and then I look at the end of the round, I go, I got more out of my money than you. And then there are some who this, they're rescuers. They don't even really care about the game. They, could, they count how many golf balls they have in their bag, how many, and if they lose one in the trees or whatever, and then they find how many they can reach. And they have these in their golf ball bag. I got to get one of these because this will make my golf game so much better. Because all I need to do then is scoop it up out of the water, reach down and grab it and rescue it. And then I win because I have... More balls at the end of the game than I did at the beginning. <laughs> it's telescopic. It reaches. And we try to reach. There we have one of these two for in here in the sanctuary to reach those light bulbs to undo it like that. And so we try to reach up to God. We try to do it in our strength. And God is saying, you don't have to. All you need to do is to grab on, hold on to my arm because my arm is strong. My arm is righteous. My arm is true. And my arm will pick you up. But I'm bringing it down to you, and I'm asking you to take hold of it. If you cry out to God as your Lord, as your rescuer, as your Savior, then why wouldn't you grab onto his hand when he comes? It's like the man who fell off the cliff, and he's like, there. He's like, help, help, somebody help. And a boy hears the voice, and the voice says, I'm here. Just let go. I got you. Trust me. Just let go of that branch, that little thing of that rock, because that's not going to hold you. I'm right here. Let go, and I will catch you. Trust me. Anybody else up there? Because <laughs> we don't want to let go. We don't want to let go of our, of our strength and our resources and trust in him. But the security that we have is when we hold on to God's hand. There was a, a major flight accident in, back in uh, 1982. Some of you at my age will remember it. Air Florida Flight 90 came out of Washington, D.C., was headed to Florida. Icy conditions. It got over, got off, and they hit a bridge over the Potomac River. You ever heard that? Remember that story? And they crashed into the icy waters of the Potomac River. 79 people on their crew and, and passengers. 73 of them did not survive the crash went into the icy waters and sank with the plane. That left six. We sang about 
He's the fourth man in the fire, Jesus being our fourth man in the fire. This story points to him being the sixth man. There are many heroes that day. The first hero is a pilot. I think his name, if I thought I had it here. Donald. Donald Usher, the, the helicopter pilot from the U.S. Park Service. What did he do? It was still stormy. It was still blowing. It was still freezing rain. But he came. He came with the helicopter because there were six people in the water. Six people trying to survive. And he came. Hero number two, crew member Gene Winsler. Winsler. He actually unbelcomed himself from well, there's a cute illustration in that buckler, unbuckler, but I won't go there. And so he unbuckled himself from his safety, and he stood on that, what's it called, a skid or something? The, huh? A skid? He stood on the skid. Can you imagine standing on the skid of a helicopter? It's going, it's being, and it's wet, and the water's coming up. And he stands on that, and he drops down the life jackets to try to get that to him, and then he drops down the life ring. And then they, they grab onto the life ring. He was willing to stand on that. And then there's uh, hero number three. His name is Lenny Skutnik. He, they gave this, uh, this ring, this life ring to this woman, and she was being dragged to the shoreline. And there were a lot of people on the shoreline, and Lenny was a government worker, came from D.C., was on, at working his job, and he came to the bank with a number of other people just on the shoreline. And she was coming, and they, they brought her in. They gave her the ring where they were in the water and brought her all the way to the shore, and she let go. She, couldn't, she didn't have the strength. She didn't have the strength to hold on anymore. So what does Lenny do? He dives in. He dives into the icy waters and goes in there and grabs her because she's already sinking. She's already going under and brings her and then other people, other heroes, help and just bring them both to the shoreline. And then there was one more hero. For a long time they didn't know his name. Arlen Williams. In fact, they gave him a title. Sixth man. Because that ring came to him first. And it came to him, and he handed it to the woman, helped her get it, and then they bring her to shore. And then it comes back, and he's still there, and he came to him, and he gave it to the next person, bring him to shore. And it came to him. And the sixth time when they came back for him, he'd gone under. Every time he rescued somebody else, every time it came to him, he saved somebody else. Why do I tell you this story? Because in all four of those people, all four of those heroes that we see, an image of you, Jesus Christ. He came. He stood in the gaps for us. He stands for us even today, standing in the gaps. He dove into the waters of death to rescue us of death and sin. He dives in. And he gave his life for us. He gave his life for us. That is the reach of our Savior. There's one other symbol. And I won't have take time to do it. It's the refuge. And we'll talk about this because another psalm talks about him being our refuge. My visual is the umbrella over there that I've never used before. And the reason I want to say this is because in the midst of that security, there's a really huge point in there that I didn't get to, and I'll get to it another time. The righteous run into it and are safe. When we obey God, when we walk with Him, when we find Him as our shelter, but you will see really tough words in there about the wrath of God in this psalm and the wrath to go against the rebellious. And so we really have a choice today if we want to know the strength of God. Righteous. That's why some of people look at it and see it's a psalm of Jesus because to the pure, you show yourself pure. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the righteous. And David talks about himself as righteous, as blameless, and as pure. And so some people try to justify that by saying, well, that was before he sinned. Well, don't you can't do that. It wasn't before he sinned. He's a sinner. He's righteous because he trusted in God. We're righteous because we trust in the righteous one, Jesus Christ. We're not righteous in ourselves, And so walk with that. And we know the Word of God, and we want to walk in the Word of God. And we have it right here, but we don't open it. We don't open it. 
I will. N I don't ever use an umbrella, and I won't. I'm too proud. <laughs> I'd rather just get wet and carry an umbrella. People think I'm Mary Poppins. But we're walking around with the Word of God that has all the strength and all the covering and all the protection, and we don't even open it. We trust in this protection that I made up so I could make some extra money this past week. <laughs> Sold these to the disc golfers who came by. <laughs> 50 cents. 50 cents. Get your protection. Get your shelter here. We're going to put the Living Waters logo on it. And we're going to sell them and we're going to reduce that debt. You think it's funny, you think it's ridiculous, because it is. But so is your strength when you compare it to the strength of the Lord. And this is my strength. So what do we do? We ask the worship team to come up and to lead us in a time of waiting on presence. And waiting is active. If you see all the action steps in this passage, it would blow you away. And we will see them again throughout the summer. You want the strength of the, the Lord? Surely I will wait for you. My soul is satisfied. My strength is renewed. I will wait for the Lord. And so I'm asking you today to take these steps. Find refuge in the Lord. Trust in His strength, not your own. Refuge not in a plastic bag. Refuge in the strong arms of God. Call out to Him. Turn to Him. If you've turned a different way, if you've turned away from him, now start to turn towards him. That's where you'll find his strength. Cry out to him. Talk to him. Tell him what you need. Tell him. He hears and he answers. Tell him. Talk to him and say, God, I need you. I need this. And recognize that his hand is coming down and take hold of his reach. Take hold of his hand. I will take refuge in you, Lord. I will call to you. I will cry for help. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep your ways. I will not turn away from my God any longer, and I will give him thanks and praise. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait on the Lord. The Lord lives at the end of this psalm. Boy, I missed out a lot of verses, didn't I? My arms are strengthened and trained by God. My feet are like the feet of a deer, enabling me to stand and reach the mountain heights. My Lord lives. Praise be to our rock. Be exalted, O oh God, our Savior. We will sing praises to your name. And so what I'd like to do uh, in closing here today is just let this song be a, a, a close, our benediction. The benediction is wait on the Lord. Okay, be strong in him. Take courage, stand with him. That's the benediction. You stand, you sit, you kneel. Wait. Be quiet and still before the Lord and take these steps wherever you're at to seek his strength. We wait on you, Lord, because we know that when we wait, we hear from you. David waited in the rocks, in the caves. David worshiped his Lord. We want to do the same.